While America's older residents are our most resilient, having lived through wars, economic downturns, and other health scares at this moment, they need easy access to quality, affordable care. How can Medicare ensure all of its beneficiaries receive timely care, whether for COVID-19 or other chronic conditions? What innovative technologies can best serve this demographic and how can underserved communities get the attention that they need and deserve? For answers to those questions and more, here's the rock star panel. I promise you all, I'm so excited about this. Karen Freeman Wilson is president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League. Nancy Lamond, Executive Vice President and Chief Advocacy and Engagement Officer of AARP. Dr. Patrice Harris is President of the American Medical Association. And Susan Peschen is President and CEO of the Alliance for Aging Research. Okay, this is super cool that you're all here. Really, really appreciate um, your time. Patrice, let me start with you. You represent physicians, frontline health care workers. We're talking about seniors today. What do you think are the two or three most important things that we could fix now to, to, to move the ticker up on how we're serving seniors in this time? Well, first of all, let me say it's a pleasure to be with you here today to make sure that we are doing our best to uh, get the best care for our seniors. And I want everyone to know that the American Medical Association has as its first priority the health of our nation. I think it's very important. We've heard a lot of talk about telehealth, and so I won't make any of those same points. Uh, certainly, we have been very glad to see work from CMS and Congress to relax some of the rules around telehealth. Uh, but there are challenges, and we will need to continue to discuss those. We want to make sure, again, those in rural areas have access, which is one of the reasons for we advocated right. for the telephone. Uh, we also want to telephone uh, coverage. Uh, we also want to make sure regarding pay parity. You heard the congressman say right. uh, that a lot of physicians have embraced this, but I, and I've experienced this myself, there's not always pay parity with uh, telehealth and in-person visits. And Can he, you explain he, to the layperson what that yes. means, pay parity? Is that that you're not reimbursed at the same levels uh, that for, is it, that, for sort of virtual care yes. versus you know, physical care. Donna Shalala was telling me about that and she said I could mention that, that Donna Shalala, the representative from uh, Florida, said that's one of the biggest problems out there that she's seeing and the frustration. So you're, that, you're, that you're making critical. a similar yes. point. And, 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 you know, as we get through this crisis, on the other side of this crisis, there will be a pent-up demand for health needs. And I'm worried, we're worried at the AMA right. about practice viability, particularly in areas that right. are already under-resourced. And so that's why that's important. Um, but we are very glad uh, right now about the, the rules. And I'll say this, I know we wanna have a discussion. I will say that um, here's is what I think we should do though. On the other side yeah. of this, we should not assume that any one uh, action is a panacea. And so when we have the time to catch our breath, we do need to have a thoughtful, I believe evidence-based conversation about what worked right. in some of these changes right. and what didn't work. Uh, not every, I, I see patients in my practice and not all of my patients like uh, telehealth. They prefer to see me in person. Of course, yeah. not everything can be <laughs> solved by telehealth. I want to get to my other panelists with you and get this all going. We can be like the view on, you know, senior health coverage, et cetera, today. But, but before I um, uh, move on, Patrice, one of my friends who actually works for a hospital system out in California said, hey, one of the challenges out there in telehealth is, the, is interoperability. Uh, and as far as I understand it in the 30 seconds I had to, you know, message back and forth, that it has to do with devices, that as we get more uh, user-friendly devices, there are actually a lot of things in terms of privacy and HIPAA and all of this that you can end up creating different ecosystems that weren't ever supposed to be connected. How big a deal is that? That is a huge deal. Uh, you know, we're still on our journey towards so while interoperability. While I'm casually talking about health by the phone, that's not, yes. a, not necessarily a good thing. And that's right. And so we will have to make sure we appreciate the context. As a psychiatrist, I'm keenly aware of issues around privacy and confidentiality. So that will have to be a key part of our discussion going forward. And I'll make one uh, last point about uh, telehealth. Again, believe that it should be integrated, right, into mm -hmm. medical homes. And what, what we should not do is allow telehealth to further fragment our care delivery system. Right, thank you, Nancy. 
You know, I, I, I took your name in vain earlier, and so I hope you'll forgive me. You know, it's hard of talking about the future of uh, retirement is work. It's one of our, you know, bylines of, you know, my friendship with ARP. But but I am interested in your dashboard right now. You, you're in touch with seniors. Susan Peschen is also, I mean, we all, you all are. But what are you um, essentially seeing right now? I want to not get into kind of kumbaya stuff. Tell us what's yeah. missing. What are people desperate for? What are we not, what needles are we not moving that you think have to be moved to, to for us to be doing a better moral and uh, a better job on the health front uh, for important members of our community? Yeah, well, thanks Steve, thanks to you and the Hill and uh, uh, Medicare Alliance for, for convening this. A few quick points I'd make. First, um, one thing we are totally struck by is how uh, engaged older Americans are right now trying to get information. You would think that was obvious, but we're doing teletown halls at the national level, local level, and we have typically 80,000, 100,000 people on the line. And what they're trying to do is understand the facts. And when they listen to the news, they are listening largely to health professionals. Uh, they may be watching a lot of other things, but they're listening to health professionals and are very interested in what the latest is in terms you of mean, views not, on not testing. To interrupt you, I, not to interrupt you, but I just want to, I, I do want to interrupt you. Richard Edelman actually made a very interesting point in his coronavirus special edition on, the, on, on trust and said that yeah. health professionals are overwhelmingly the, pe the, the people, the voices uh, that Americans are looking for. They rank sort of 80 to 90 percent in terms of the trusted voices. Politicians are down about 25 to 30 percent, if I got the numbers right. Anyway, I just wanted to agree with you um, vigorously. Go ahead. No question on health professionals. I, I always say that uh, uh, next to your grandchild, the most important person in the world to you is your doctor. Um, and that's holding true right now. Um, so there's a lot of interest in really solid information, not surprising given that um, older Americans know that they are uh, more at risk than many other parts of, um, right. of society. Um, Second thing we're finding, and this relates to something people said earlier, is that 80% um, you know, of older Americans have a pre-existing condition, and they are not going for treatment for a lot of other things in light of the scare about being in a doctor's office, talking to a doctor with COVID. We think over the long run, this is very serious and something right. we're going to have to see how to address. Telehealth is part of this. People have talked about it a lot. I won't get into a lot of detail, but also let's remember that uh, part of the reason people aren't as equipped to do telehealth right now is the fact that First, it was not reimbursed by most of the Medicare plans. Second, there's reluctance on the part of patients and some physicians mm -hmm. to use it. And fully a third of seniors um, don't have home broadband or a smartphone. And so right. we're going to have to kind of work through that. I think in the unvarnished um, uh, truth area, we'd have to look at the post-acute care system or non-system as we might want to call it. A lot of attention understandably on hospitals, but think about what's happening in our nation's nursing homes. Uh, majority of deaths have occurred in nursing homes. We have been very active at the national level and at the state level to ensure that nursing homes are first of all disclosing the number of cases they have. Um, second, that the workers in nursing homes, assisted livings, and home health care professionals are able to get the kind of equipment, protective equipment they need in order to not transmit the disease. And then um, finally is to uh, make sure that there is a way for family members to visit their loved ones. Uh, there is nothing right. more wrenching than to think about people being close to death and not able to communicate at all with their loved ones. And then finally, I just wanted to make the point you and I talked about earlier and several people mentioned, and that is we have been stunned at how many people have raised food insecurity issues during this period. And a huge part of it is people just not having food. We're pushing for more right. SNAP benefits. And the second part of it is being able to get food. And we're pleased to see so many volunteer activities helping people get food in their homes. Well, that's quite a punch list. And thank you for being candid. Some of this is in you know, the, the sandboxes of our other colleagues on the panel here. Patrice, I know, you know yeah. I've, I've been looking at this issue of elective 
now not only just elective surgeries, but you know what you're talking about, doctor's visits, being in touch with physicians and having that care, which is also, in my view, a kind of mental health thing when you're, when you're looking yeah. at this beyond a physical health thing. And I know that Patrice's crowd, if I can call him that, are under orders not to not to uh, entertain some of those uh, visits, right, Patrice? Well, I think there's a tiered system. There was some misunderstanding of that. And certainly, ultimately, at least from CMS guidelines, they left the decision right. as appropriate up to the physician to decide. Uh, but certainly, well, yes, yes, yes. So it was some tiered uh, levels of, uh, of, of surgery a non-urgent, perhaps, surgery. Right. Uh, but yes, absolutely, a lot of patients and physicians have postponed care. And we really, I, I know this is a, another area, and we're not going to talk about it here today, but as we open up, open back up, right. uh, certainly... We That's should, my friend Karen is going to get into that. Right. Well, we should, I'll just put a plug in, we should be <laughs> yeah. prioritizing in that first group, in the first yeah. phase, based on data, healthcare establishments. And that is making sure they have the PPE necessary, uh, so right. that they can see patients and begin to uh, do Good. some of those surgeries and procedures. Good point. Well, I want to talk to Karen and, and Susan uh, both. Susan, let me you know bring you in because you know another big part of this picture that I think has not been receiving uh, enough attention is the bias and discrimination built in the system. We have been talking about uh, age bias, age discrimination, how we think about health, and to a certain degree. I mean, I, I want to be candid here, and I want to also be able to get on TV again. There has been a kind of weird sense that the elder community doesn't matter as much in some of the commentary I've seen out there. I've been shocked by that. I'd love to get your thoughts and reactions on, I assume you think that's an unhealthy track, um, but how do we fix some of this? And I want to bring my friend Karen in uh, to also talk about, as we look at this kind of broad ecosystem, how do we make sure that we're creating a holistic, inclusive approach that's real and not fake when it comes to uh, community health? Um, Susan? Um, well, Steve, thank you for having me. And thanks to the Better Medicare Alliance. We're actually a member, so I'm really happy to be a part of today's program. Uh, I wanted to first mention, before I answer the question about rationing, just that aging organizations, and I think the aging network, we all need to play a role in encouraging older adults if they do feel like they're experiencing symptoms of heart attack or of stroke, uh, to not hesitate calling 911. There has been so much focus on telehealth and it's been incredible. But if you fall, if you, you know, have an injury, anything serious. All the other stuff that goes on in people's lives, yeah. So it doesn't stop. Right. There's a lot of natural fear about going to the hospital right now. But we don't want to deter people uh, from getting emergency care if they need it. Uh, in terms of rationing, there's really sort of two issues that I think the COVID-19 um, a pandemic is raised. One are the state rationing plans. We're sort of seeing differences in states across the country uh, with limits and setting sort of definitions about who should get uh, resources if there are shortages. And we heard a lot of horror stories out of uh, Europe and it started to raise sort of, um, you know, philosophical conversations as if right. For something that were just like a philosophical issue. Um, and there were states that had uh, limitations for people with intellectual or cognitive disabilities, age cutoffs. I mean, some really barbaric, almost eugenics type, you know. Right, right. Reasons. So the HHS Office of Civil Rights, I have to give you know, kudos to them. They really, they put out a bulletin at the end of March to basically say, look, we have civil rights laws in this country and don't go against them. And some of the states have backed off, pulled off their plans. Um, but the other, and there needs to be more specific guidance. Right. Around that. There's still problems and they're gonna, I think, be putting out more specific guidance in the coming weeks. The other issue that I think it's raised is, you know, rationing goes on in the United States, sort of in the background, and we don't talk about it that much. But there is an organization, organization called the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, and it's known as ICER for short, and they use discriminatory and old-fashioned economic algorithms 
uh, there's one that's called Quali, Quality Adjusted Life Years, and it's really kind of an old-fashioned economic model that other areas in, in economics right. and from health don't use. And yeah. they create these reports that restrict access uh, for, to new treatments to all types of groups right. of folks because it discriminates in particular against people with disabilities and mm -hmm. older adults. And I'm hoping that as we're having these conversations, that we have conversations both about the COVID related ones, but then what is happening on a day-to-day -day level here and that we need to move away from quality. We need to move away from judging the patient and things about right. the patient and look no, at- No, I'm so grateful. Treatments. Yeah, I'm so grateful that you brought this um, up and I, I, I see it right now across not only the healthcare front, uh, I've been uh, uh, made aware of some of the challenges with people with disabilities, but also elders uh, in things like voting. I mean, we are in the political season. We're going to elect the president of the United States and many other elected leaders uh, in November. And, you know, there's a broad question right now, not only, you know, particularly about people uh, with uh, uh, disabilities, but our elder community, I think broadly about not thinking through that. But that is a different show for a different day. Um, but Karen, Urban League, um, you know, community health, making these various uh, uh, nodes come together and work well, and you sit in that in that league of how do you make sure that everybody's engaged to the to the best we can make them as we're beginning to thinking about reopening the economy in phased ways, and what we've seen through this crisis is a lot of communities have been screwed, have been they're they're bearing the uh, a disproportionate share of infection, of mortality, of impacts, uh, both financial er, across the board. And I, I wanna get your insights into what's happening um, from your perspective, but any insights you have for all of us on what we can do to remedy this and to be smarter um, as, we, as we begin to move out of this crisis. Well, uh, Steve, first let me add my thanks for being included in what we know Absolutely. to be an extremely important conversation. And you're absolutely right. We've seen it uh, in Chicago in a very pronounced way that there has clearly been a disparity both in the incidence of this pandemic, uh, both in the uh, diagnosis as well as the death rate. But we've also seen as people have tried to access healthcare, as people have tried to uh, deal with the uh, impact of social distancing, a uh, disparate impact, uh, both in education, housing, uh, small businesses, and in the workforce. But as it mm -hmm. relates to our seniors, there is also a concern about the social isolation, uh, the inability to not only connect with relatives, but with your social networks. And we know in the African-American community, one of the most important social networks is church. Uh, mm. Now we're having Zoom on, uh, church on Zoom. Now we're um, having to depend on uh, calls, phone calls or other ways to connect with our pastors and those in our uh, church or other social networks. And as we begin to open up, we know that some of these networks will be the last to open up because of the large numbers of people involved. And so I think it's important, particularly for our seniors, that we think about how do we ensure that connectivity? How do we ensure that we are not isolating them even more? And as we look at open, opening the economy back up, what do we need to do from a policymaker standpoint to minimize those disparities? And that is what we're doing at the Urban League. The Chicago Urban League is announcing a health center that is focused on these issues as we mm. begin the, uh, to plan for the recovery phase. And one of those key things is allowing for a wellness check for not just our seniors, but for all in our community so that we can begin to check in on those people who might not have uh, a network of relatives or friends who regularly check on them. Right. 
Look, I, I, I've got Fred Upton coming up in, in just a little bit. He's, he's a sure. great guy. Um, we got a good vibe. And it just occurs to me, I want to I want to get and bring a question up. We have a question in the audience to come up. But while we have a minute and we have a legislator on, and I'm going to make sure that this goes out widely and broadly in the Washington policy community, I want to ask each of you just for a 30 second slice of what do you need legislators right now in this time to most move, I don't expect you all to be saying, but what, when it comes to covering seniors, when it comes to, you know, uh, Medicare innovation and what we're seeing out there, just give me one hit at the bat of what you need done. Patrice? I would say testing. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we really need to make sure we have a robust national testing strategy. And that is not just the tests, not just the swabs, it's all of that. Uh, but we also right. need to make sure that there's a workforce uh, that can trace do the contact right. tracing. And for those who have to be isolated or quarantined, we need support. Mm. Uh, many folks live in multi-generational families. If a senior lives in the home, right. but an essential worker has tested positive, they need somewhere else to go. So we need laser focus right. on testing. Got it. good, good, good hit at the bat. Uh, good, good bat at the hit, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, Nancy Lamont. Um, I would say obviously um, agree with testing and uh, I think looking at all of these changes we've made in the face of a crisis and seeing what needs and should be sustained um, as we go back to uh, so-called normalcy and then really what this has taught me is we need all of us need to spend much more time thinking through uh, the post-acute care world, nursing homes, assisted living, uh, home care and what all of that really means um, in our long-term care uh, efforts. Right, thank you, that's a good one. Susan, uh, I, I think this issue is, is uh, ripe for talking about out-of-pocket costs for seniors in Medicare Part D. And uh, we need to finally cap those costs for folks. I think it's wonderful that there have been, uh, um, you know, CMS has relaxed some of the regs right. around being three months of your medication. But if you can't right. afford the out-of-pocket costs, that doesn't help you a heck of a lot. So I think a cap on those costs is smoothing for folks who aren't able to afford it all right. at once. And those are things that were on the table for discussion prior to this pandemic happening. Right. And we have to kind of keep our eye on the ball and revisit. Thank you. Karen, I'm going to give you the last word before we've got a question from our audience. Um, just give us the thing you need the Congress to hear. I, I think the quantification of this disease, uh, certainly we want to do it by race and gender, but I would say that we have to keep statistics by age groups so that we will know the impact that this disease is having on every age uh, by race, by gender, and by the other statuses that uh, matter to them making policies that will help them to rectify uh, or to prevent us from repeating what we're seeing right now. Right. Thank you. What a great uh, discussion. We have Marguerite Pridgen, who's the Director of Federal Policy for the Corporation for Supportive Housing. Marguerite, thanks for joining us. And I understand you have a question that you'd like to pose. I do. It's kind of a two-part question. The first relates to uh, in the nursing homes we had talked about. I want to know specifically what improvements do you think are needed in supportive housing, such as nursing homes, assisted living, to prevent the virus spread we've seen? And the second part relates to, is there an underlying broader issue uh, related to the workforce? Uh, what do we need to improve or expand uh, the, the geriatric workforce in terms of you know, what quantity, quality, and oversight of that workforce to ensure that we have uh, the best solution for our seniors? Great questions. I'm gonna ask my, my panel to be brief in answers, but let me start with Nancy Lamond. Um, what do we need to do with housing, nursing homes? What do we need to do in workforce? Well, we need to get people protective uh, equipment and gears and be able to um, uh, test them if they're taking care of folks. We need to know what's actually going on there right. in terms of transparency. And in terms of workforce, we're going to have to grow our home care workforce and we're going to have to support family caregivers much more uh, than we Got have it. today. Got it. Susan? Uh, 
I think in the nursing home setting in particular, Congress um, and the nursing home industry has been very reluctant to addressing staff ratios. And that's part right. of why we had such a problem there. So I think a willingness uh, to you know, address that head on is really what's needed for infection control moving forward. Great, Karen? I would um, certainly agree with my colleagues. I would also say that widespread testing early on in nursing homes and similar settings is extremely important. I think we've seen a lot of them hide their heads in the sand. They almost don't want to know. The other thing mm -hmm. as it relates to the workforce, we have to ensure right. that we are not impacting accessibility of seniors to the workforce. We have to put those measures in place that will protect them, but also still allow them to participate widely. We need that wisdom. Right. Right, I'm gonna give the last word to Patrice. I'd say targeted testing and, and PPE, and, and in some ways to support uh, caregivers actually who are mm -hmm. navigating uh, not seeing relatives and not having information. Yes. Marguerite, thank you so much for that question. I wanna thank my panel, Patrice Harris, Nancy Lamont, Susan Peschen, Karen Freeman-Wilson, thank you so much. Really, hope, and, and stick around, we're gonna have a great uh, exchange now.